Hello there, my name's Vince, I'm a composer, and in this video I wanted to do a little bit of a retrospective on one of my pieces that I just finished working on. It's an orchestral mock-up with a particular focus on the strings. This isn't intended to be a full track breakdown or a tutorial on how to do string mock-ups, it's more of just a collection of thoughts and things that are particularly fresh in my mind having just finished working on this. I think there are some lessons that I learned that I thought might be useful just to put out there as general tips for working in this particular style of music. So without further ado, I'll play back the track in Logic. Um, it's quite short, and then we'll just talk through some of my thoughts. In terms of my dramatic inspiration, uh, I called the piece Pass It On. Maybe it starts off with one character, but then this kind of idea is being passed around and it's just escalating and escalating. Just the gears starting to be in motion or a plan starting to unfold. So from that initial sort of spark and inspiration to just everything kind of coming together. So I wanted to create this kind of quite light flowing, but also quite... Um, something with a lot of momentum and with a definite build and a definite kind of climax to it. So first of all, to briefly describe the overall process that led to this piece, um, my initial writing stage was done using a couple of piano patches. It's a technique that I quite often use when working on orchestral music. Um, and I also supplemented that with my famous string sketch patches, which you might have seen if you've watched any of my other videos. Um, this basically consists of a layered shorts patch with a long patch um, with a little bit more um, like the ability to add a tremolo on the fly and things like that but basically what it results in is a polyphonic patch that I can play two-handed and I can use the breath controller for expression and then I can also play in a staccato way and it just gives me access to sort of everything very easily very quickly so let me just give you a quick example <laughs> You know, so I can sort of do all of that just sketching at the piano, which is very useful for me as a pianist and as an improviser to sort of just get the ideas down on the page. And working with an instrument like this rather than the piano patch is good because with more lyrical, long, flowing, evolving lines... You know, I can sort of do all of that stuff and the information is just captured, it's, it's gotten down on paper. So what happened was I sketched in all of my initial ideas and then there was a slightly more formal process of sorting through those ideas and extracting what then later became 
the violin one, violin two, viola, cello and bass. And so at that point I introduced these track stacks which contains the CSS patches which are going to be the final patches that are going to perform my music which was a rather laborious process but it sort of is a useful part of refining the arrangement. By doing that it allowed me to quickly identify where there were some holes where there was just you know some uh, just a cello sitting there with nothing to do and maybe the opportunity for it to create some supporting action or maybe just to leave it as it was but in any case I was kind of making that decision more consciously at that point. After that kind of pass of just moving the MIDI data around and consolidating parts then I basically went back and did a secondary pass of making them sound a bit more alive and just getting really meticulous with the CC information and the legato speeds and all of that kind of stuff. And in that particular stage, what I realized was it's quite important to stay focused on the most important things because there's a basically an infinite amount of tweaking and shaping that you can do. And so it's important to try and stay relatively zoomed out and focus on getting the basic balances right, you know, which things you want to be in the foreground, which things you want to be in the background, and any lead lines. So my overall process basically involved a sketch stage, then refining the arrangement, particularly with the strings distributing to the different string instruments, and then filling in some of the holes in the arrangement, doing a first pass with CSS, and then spending time really shaping those performances and finally a little bit of mixing at the end. So now let's talk about the subject of expression and dynamically shaping these performances and what I've learned in the process of making this particular track. So the first thing was that I spent a very long time really shaping the main melody of the piece, just spending a lot of time there getting really really meticulous about the CC information and actually getting down and dirty with the pencil tool in Logic. So let me show you what I mean. So the point here is we've got our main melody of the piece here very clearly. This is the kind of protagonist of the piece and so it really deserves a lot of our focus and our attention and our effort to make this thing come alive. For me, working with the pencil tool and sort of manually putting in these little peaks and troughs and, and clicking in stuff like this, these ramps, um, it's quite a new concept to me because I generally, as an improviser, as a performer, I tend to gravitate towards trying to just play everything in in real time and sort of feel my way through the performance, whereas this is a lot more kind of calculated and a bit more trial and error. But I find specifically when working with Cinematic Studio Strings, it kind of has its own particular quirks in terms of the timings and how the legato transitions work. And so there's really no set way to do it other than to just really kind of go, okay, what's wrong with it and what can I improve and just go step by step like that. There's just quite a lot of information in there and I spend a lot of time kind of singing it and trying to hear where did I want the, the kind of peaks to land, where did I want those kind of emphasis points to be. And there's no set answers for this stuff. I mean, unlike if you're mocking up an existing piece of music that you already have a recording of, you know, you don't have any reference points for this stuff. So part of my job as a composer is to use my imagination to try and hear the kind of correct way of phrasing these things. And it's so context dependent. And so I just found um, it was a really big imaginative challenge apart from anything else. It's easy for these things to just end up being a bit flat or a bit lifeless because, um, you know, obviously a real string section would do all of that kind of expression very naturally and um, also there would be a lot of work with the conductor to decide on the precise interpretation of a passage like that. I spent a lot of time nudging things around using the nudge uh, key command in Logic. I have that set up to option and then the arrow keys and just nudging things by really small increments until it just sits really comfortably in the track. The other thing I generally found was when it comes to these sorts of curves, um, I'm always quite tempted especially if I'm playing something in real time to kind of max out the mod wheel uh, or whatever it is if it's a breath controller kind of just to to kind of have these values slammed up against the top here 
and um, usually it's because maybe the track isn't turned up enough in my mix and so I'm trying to make it kind of more and more present by just kind of maxing out the dynamic and so that was something that I noticed myself doing while working on this piece so as you can see here and if we just maybe look at the strings more generally we're not doing a lot of hitting the absolute ceiling here there's only a couple of times where we're hitting the top so it's quite obvious now that I say it but just that general principle of um, using the whole dynamic range, not falling into the pitfall of just kind of trying to make everything sound powerful, but actually inviting in the use of contrast dynamically. While we're on this topic of dynamics, the other thing that I was reminded of when working on this piece was how useful it is to think of dynamics at two levels. Um, so for example, in the intro, the uh, short note articulations here are being determined, the volume is being determined by the velocity. Um, so if I just solo this one. The kind of accent pattern there da, 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 is being determined by careful use of velocity, which you can see here. Um, but then simultaneously I have this this automation ride going on, which I think I actually recorded using a fader. And that just gives it this higher level sort of overall dynamic ebb and flow to it. So there are those two kind of dynamic things going on simultaneously, if that makes sense. Another example might be if you have, say, an ostinato that goes and you've got this kind of up and down thing going on and you want that whole thing to just gradually get louder then you could do the sort of shape of the phrase using say the mod wheel and then use cc11 the expression to just create an overall crescendo um, but this isn't necessarily something you want to do just as a general rule like always have two dynamic levels it's more just something that can be useful in certain musical situations. And it also kind of crosses over a bit into mixing. You know, you might use track automation to just create a dynamic boost over a period of time um, in a particular section while still preserving all of the inner motions and dynamics and, and patterns that you've got going on. The other aspect that I wanted to mention that relates to the sort of expressivity of the programming here um, is to do with vibrato and specifically just the decision of how to use it. In CSS specifically, Cinematic Studio Strings, you've got the option to take out the vibrato um, or just to kind of mix it in a little bit. It does affect the way that the legato transitions work, but especially since the 1.7 update is pretty solid. I knew that for this particular piece, I really wanted quite a smooth sound. I didn't want it to be overly emotional and romantic. This CC lane here at the bottom um, is my vibrato control. Um, and let's just listen to it in context. I've got it fairly low, which just, yeah, it kind of cleans up the sound a little bit for me. It really changes the character of the sound. And then here I knew I wanted it to get a little bit more intense. You know, and there are a few other parts that are emphasizing that change and also bringing in a bit of vibrato. And so um, just the cumulative effect of all of that is just that extra little bit of attention to detail and, and just communicating a little bit more to the listener what the piece is about. On starting this piece, I was actually a little bit unsure as to how the library would perform when you start taking away the vibrato. So I was pleased to find that um, at least on the most recent update of the library, it performs really well. And actually you do have that option to play with a more neutral sounding tone, which is really nice to know. With material that primarily involves short notes, the main expressive medium is going to be the velocity at which those short notes are played, um, the intensity of those short notes. And so um, there's that opportunity to get really fine grain with the velocities here. So for example, at the end of the piece, we've got uh, this happening. And just that simple and um, kind of quite obvious detail of accenting those upper and lower parts of the phrase. And, you know, equalizing the velocity values in all of the other parts so it's consistent. 
for me just gives this part, part a really clear focus from an arranging perspective. And that just that extra bit of realism as well. So next a couple of general thoughts about tone and tonal sculpting when doing a string mock-up. I sort of knew this already but it was a nice reminder that just using a single library can really help with this aspect. Um, it sort of tends to mix itself especially if it's a well-recorded library like this one is. Sometimes it's unavoidable or just useful to layer multiple string libraries together, particularly to just create certain slightly more out there effects or just maybe to fatten up the sound a bit. Um, however, what can happen is that um, it creates a lot of problems in terms of both the kind of clarity of things and also you might end up with odd builds up build ups of different frequency areas. All of that's fine as long as you've kind of got the, the ears and the sensibility to recognize it. Um, but it's just quite a nice bonus when you work with a single string library, you don't get some of those problems. In this particular instance, I also sprinkled in some of the Cinematic Studio solo strings down here, but it wasn't done in a kind of uh, one size fits all type of way. I just wanted to uh, make use of that extra definition for specific moments, so usually important melodies. So for example, we've got this important cello line happening. If we solo the solo cello. It's pretty turned up in the mix. If we take it out, and then put it back in. Take it out. For me, what it does is it just brings a certain focus. It um, takes what's naturally quite a warm and fuzzy sound and just adds that little bit of edge to it, um, which is a device for drawing attention to, uh, to that part, um, which is what I wanted to do. So that's the sort of the way in which I'm approaching this use of solo instruments. So I did a little bit of tonal sculpting with the EQ here. You can see on the violin ones. Um, so it's nothing drastic if I just play it in isolation. And then take off the EQ. Put it back in. It's all very subtle stuff. For me it's just removing a little bit of the tubbiness from it, which in this particular musical context I wanted to get rid of because I felt it needed a slightly more airy sort of sound because of the vibe of the piece, though I wanted the strings to feel very light and unencumbered. There might be another kind of scenario where the thing that I'm hearing as tubbiness might be interpreted as kind of warmth or uh, richness or something like that. So it really is uh, very dependent on all manner of things, um, not just technical aspects like the range of the instrument and where it's playing primarily in the track, but also um, more general things to do with atmosphere and vibe. In general I've been very light touch with processing, um, almost nothing. Um, just a few bits of EQ on the main string buses here. I try to go with the flow and collaborate with the sound that I'm getting naturally from the samples. The other thing which I did on this particular track which I generally don't do is mess around with the mic mix on the plugin itself. As you can see I've boosted the main uh, mics quite a lot and uh, brought down the room a little bit. What this is achieving is again something that's very specific to the vibe of the track. Um, I wanted to create quite an open, quite a relaxed feeling sound, especially in the melody line, and so I wanted to sort of remove some of the intensity that was present in the mic mix that was the kind of default option. So let's just compare it really quickly. <laughs> So this is my current settings, and if I just turn these off and go to the ma main mix, which is just the default. There's a bit more focus to the sound there, whereas to me this is a lot more sort of open. And a bit more just chilled. That was actually quite a, a big discovery for me as somebody who, I don't know, I tend to just focus on the writing and the arrangement generally more than mix and so I tend to very often just leave the samples in their default state because I figure well they've you know optimized them for most situations so you can't go too badly wrong which I think is fair but um, yeah just using the mic positions 
but with a kind of expressive or dramatic intention um, was quite like a new concept for me and quite a fun thing that I did on this piece. In terms of ambience, I'm doing the classic trick of having two sends and sending one to a slightly smaller reverb and one to a slightly bigger reverb. Um, I'm actually using two algorithmic reverbs, which is a bit of a twist on the Jake Jackson method where he uses a convolution combined with, I think, an algorithmic. Um, but anyway, um, they're only being used quite subtly. So if I play a little bit of the track and then I'll just stop it and you can hear the reverb bloom so you can sort of hear how much there is in the track. So it's substantial, but you'll find that if I just play the track and then turn off the reverbs... So this is without reverb. And then I'll put it back in. It's not, you know, it's not doing a huge amount, so again... Um, as always, I'm trying to think about priorities and where I'm going to spend my time. And so spending my time, for example, crafting the the performance of the lead melody in the violins, I'm going to spend a lot more time there than I am um, fiddling around with reverb, um, at least on this project in this particular context where I'm sort of mixing everything and doing everything myself. Finally, let's talk about the arrangement. Again, this isn't intended to be a track breakdown, so I'm not going to go through the arrangement as a whole, um, but there was one thing that I was quite uh, pleased with myself about, um, and that was the sort of call and response nature of the counter melody to the main melody. So just the cellos and the violas there, kind of underneath the main melody. And using those swells, using those little um, bits of dynamics to kind of help them pop through in the gaps between the melody phrases. So there, and there. Um, so, you know, that was a nice little thing that worked out quite well organically as I was working on this piece and um, something that I'll definitely maybe try and do a bit more intentionally next time. One of the things that's slightly unusual that you might have noticed is the fact that the piece is in five and f that presents a few challenges from a compositional and arranging perspective. It actually, I feel it limited my options quite a lot because I was really thinking about how can I despite the fact that it's in a complex time signature, how can I make the ideas really clear and not confuse the listener too much, but at the same time keep them on the edge of understanding everything so that it still has some mystery and some interest and in intrigue. So um, what that meant in practice was that a lot of my melody lines, counter melody lines, accompanying figures, um, and just ideas in general were relatively broad brush, relatively predictable, um, so an example would be the brass writing at the end of this piece. I know this is primarily a, a string mock-up chat, but originally I actually had something a bit more involved going on, but I ended up going for this really kind of straightforward, blocky kind of... Uh Like I originally had little sort of da -da -da, boom -bum -bum -bum, kind of little moments. It just felt more effective to kind of uh, do something clearer. And so, you know, a lot of the time with this arrangement, um, I was just trying to stabilize things because of the inherent nature of being in five and um, being quite unstable. In the uh, backing figures in the woodwinds and the harp and the piano and things like that, and marimba. <laughs> And also, I think, in the violas. We have this uh, very simple arpeggio pattern that's just holding down and, and telegraphing the five groupings and the way that the sort of the piece is structured in terms of these rhythmic cells. 
It's kind of just saying to us one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five, and making it really clear that like this is where the cycle is, this is where the repetition is, this is where the pattern is. As usual, what I found when writing this piece was that I started off making it too complicated um, and too alienating basically for a casual listener. Um, and I ended up trying to uh, reinforce some of those elements like that repeating arpeggio, putting that, doubling that in the woodwinds, making that kind of thing more present as a way of stabilizing the overall arrangement, a process of simplifying it into something a little bit more friendly, but hopefully still interesting. The only other thing that I wanted to say about this arrangement was how hard it was for me to resist putting in big damage style uh, percussion, big epic percussion, especially in this last section. <laughs> I so had this big rolling and sort of snare drums going and all that kind of stuff, which was fine. But I suddenly realized that the arrangement was starting to get away from me. Um, and that this idea that I had of creating something a bit more organic and a bit more flowy and kind of effortless was suddenly becoming this like militaristic kind of march thing um, that sounded really cool sonically and sounded really impressive and grandiose, but actually wasn't quite true to my original intentions for the piece. And so that's just another little um, element of my journey when writing this piece. So finally, just a few observations about my experience of using Cinematic Studio series specifically um, and uh, trying to make that sound as realistic as possible. The first thing I wanted to say was just I really enjoyed using the longest articulation on the shorts patch as a way of creating a kind of detaché style um, pattern here, for example here. It feels quite joined up and you can really hear those um, bow strokes, like the repetition of the bows, and that gives it that sense of it kind of going backwards and forwards, which is, you know, was very key to what I wanted to establish in terms of the mood, as opposed to it all being kind of slurred, da 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 on like a single bow. The other thing was that I generally found that while I was working meticulously on these melody lines, and especially these lyrical sections, and I was playing around um, trying to get the phrasing right, I often found that if I was using the fast legato mode, then it was creating a little bit of an accentuation or a bump in the dynamic, which felt a bit distracting. And so often lowering the legato speed to medium or slow kind of resolved that. What I realized was actually medium or slow almost refers more to the speed of the melody that's being written than to the speed of the legato transition itself. Previously, as a way of trying to speed up my compositional and mock-up process, I was just doing everything on the grid and using the fastest legato transition for absolutely everything and then setting a negative track delay, which is, a, again, a perfectly valid way to work, especially if you're in a high pressure environment like film scoring where you need to deliver stuff quickly. But for me, because I was working on this piece just for pleasure, um, I wanted to really be adding a lot of nuance and taking full advantage of all of the legato transitions um, was something that was quite nice and kind of refreshing to me um, to take that sort of degree of care. It did mean that I had to spend more time nudging around things manually, you know, in terms of timing, but ultimately it felt worth it because I was able to express the particular thing that was in my head and that was kind of all the reward that I needed. And the other thing to note was that what I found was when I was putting a lot of time doing those kinds of micro timing adjustments, it was time well spent because of the nature of the library um, being very internally consistent. It meant that if I play back a phrase and then I hit stop and then I play back the same phrase, even though there are round robins presumably happening underneath the surface, I still felt like my intention that I was trying to get across through my meticulous programming was preserved for the most part. And that was just a really encouraging thing because it meant that it was worthwhile me putting in that extra legwork to make something sound really musical and it wasn't going to suddenly just have a note that stuck out because of inconsistent scripting you know. So that's it for this little ramble through some reflections on my piece Pass It On. Uh, if you'd like to hear the track in full again with some nice visuals um, and just as a standalone video you can find it on my YouTube channel. Um, do consider subscribing to the channel. I don't normally say that because I find it quite annoying when other people request it. I mostly do uh, 
track breakdowns and, and talking about basically the craft of making music using virtual instruments as well as real instruments and also my work as a video game and TV composer and I'm always open to uh, video ideas I'm still quite new to this YouTube thing so I'd love to hear any thoughts in the comments and until next time good luck with your composing stay creative and I'll see you on the next video